Yeah. I was asked if I can for a minute about this whole idea of certain plants or certain substances have certain attributes or certain places that they take people to. I've had the ideation that you're talking about, so the visualization of the snakes, the cats, the jungle, the the, the um, um, pyramids, the whole you know Mayan aspect, jungle, the shamanic routine on LSD, on mushrooms, on ibogaine. And on Yahe. And I've had clients that have had it have that same mediation doing breath work. Well so, yeah, this this so raises a you know, this where? raises a real question. Uh one of the things and the black people. <laughs> the black people the black people were on the high game, which I expected. <laughs> but not the but not the other one. Yeah, I don't understand exactly how this works. I will join your side for a moment because there's a phenomenon I've noticed, and some of you have heard me talk about it. It's possible to do this on psilocybin. It's really easy to do it on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, in a way, is somehow more open to suggestion. These other things have their own agenda. Ayahuasca will work with you. But one of the bizarre things that you can do on ayahuasca is you can suggest a period like, let's say, uh, Italian Baroque. You just say it in your mind. And paintings, altar pieces, architectural spaces, balustrades, vehicles, armament, saddlery, uh, clothing, uh, uh, serving utensils, bowls, pewter, candelabra, all of this stuff will begin drifting toward, and it's just, and it is high Baroque. In fact, it is, it is more Baroque than the Baroque. It's obviously what they were shooting for, you know? <laughs> and then, and then you just, a hawk headed guy, and you just, and they say, Art Deco. And thousands of cigarette lighters, uh, coffee tables, uh, yeah. And, uh, and more intensely realized than you ever actually encounter these things in real life. Well, now what does that mean? Uh, I have no idea, first of all. The possibilities seem to be that what we call styles, or what we call motifs, are actually um, categories in the unconscious. But the amazing thing about it is, having looked at the Italian Baroque, dynastic Egypt, and Art Deco, you can also say to it, so surprise me. And suddenly, it can surprise you, a hundred percent. It can show you objects that you cannot place to any set of motifs, any historical period, past, present, or future. And then you can say to it, surprise me again. And it gives you surprise B, which is completely different from surprise A, and also not related to any known style. So then you say, well, are styles categories in the unconscious, and how many of them are there? And, and what does it mean then for a group of people in 1680, or 1930, to suddenly find one of these places and punch into it. And then another question is, is there a, a necessary historical progression or is it by chance? In other words, could the world, could the political world of the 16th century have lived with the design motifs of Art Deco? Could we have had uh, Columbus arriving in America in a ship uh, consonant with the best canons of Bauhaus design? Strange questions, friends. Is there succession, necessary succession in style, or are these things uh, pure chance? So, I don't know, Re returning to and responding to your demonic advocacy, it may be that going to Tikal preconditions you, that that pushes the button, and then when you take the psychedelic, you discover that the high Mayan, the classic Mayan button had been set, and then you find all this stuff. It's a little more bewildering to have it happen uh, in your living room. So My feeling about it is that those experiences are available to anybody in, in, in various states and there are various ways to get there. Uh, and my hand 
I don't feel that it's mutually exclusive to say that 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 some substances do seem to have a certain predilection for for certain kinds of, of, of experiences. Now I've had the, I've had both both feelings about it that it's that it, that range of experiences that band of experience is available, and some things are more likely to put me there than others. Well, um, LSD is a relative of morning glories. So if you got Mexican imagery off LSD, that would be understandable. It may be that all the indoles resonate together. And, uh, you know, Rupert's fond of saying the morphogenetic uh, or the thing which is most impinging on the present is the immediate and most closely related past. But also impinging is the uh, are, are the related past moments and the related contingencies. Perhaps all of the indoles uh, can access each other. One one thing that I've done uh, on psilocybin, and you might try this. This is an interesting experiment. Once you get it up and running smoothly, then you can say to it, "Be MDMA." And it will be it. And you, and you can say to it, be LSD. And it loves to do imitations of other psychoactive drugs. Well, I don't know. You, I don't think you can say to MDMA, be DMT, and, and it will move. You hope not, don't you? <laughs> and it would move over into that space. But... See, obviously, it's some kind of freely commanded modality in the psyche with which we can have a relationship if we will but evolve a control language and a dialogue. And it remains mysterious. It is it, uh, a point that I made yesterday that I think is worth repeating. The psychedelic experience is the beginning of the spiritual path. That's why it's not important that yogins claim that they can deliver you the psychedelic experience because it begins with the psychedelic experience. And then you go from there. Uh, I said something like this a few weeks ago at the John Ford Theater in L.A. and this guy got up and said, so why don't you take more? Which I think is a very interesting question very valid for me personally and the answer is uh, our whole lives we conceive of spiritual development as looking for the answer you know is it Taoism is it diet is it uh, Tantra we look for the answer and I think we have become so accustomed to looking for the answer that it's never really entered our minds what it would be like to find it, to have it, yes. And once you come face to face with these psychedelics, the trail ends that you have found the answer. Not because you are, I mean, perhaps because you're smart, perhaps you're, because you're lucky, perhaps because you deserved it, perhaps because you hang out with the right people. You have found the answer. Now the question is, what the hell do you do with it? Because the answer is going to make hash out of your life because your life is based on living without the answer. <laughs> so suddenly, it's not, you know, I want to be an enlightened being, I want to be a shaman, I want to be a Taoist, I want to be a yogi. Be it! See how you like it. So the answer to the question of why don't why don't I take more is because I don't I'm uh, attached. Basically, it is entirely my own attachments that now impede my spiritual growth. Nobody's holding me back. Nothing is holding me back except my. Uh, sense of the awesomeness of what is now possible. And this is true of everybody who reaches a certain point. The, think of the Taoist sage on Cold Mountain who has been up there in the fog and the mist and the rock escarpments for 30, 40, 50 years. 
and the people in the village occasionally mention him to each other and say, you know, is old Fu Si still alive? Has anyone seen him recently? And someone will say, oh yes, I saw him three years ago across a valley gathering wood, but when I approached, he ran further up the mountain and disappeared. To be Fu Si is entirely possible. You know, to actually attain what we have previously thought of as unattainable spiritual accomplishments. But I don't foresee, I don't think it can happen uh, without leaving everything. You know, do you really want to be a Taoist hermit circulating the light for 200 years in a cave high up above Timberline? You can, you know, there's nothing stopping you once you understand that this psychedelic vehicle is available. Uh, I'm appalled at that. I mean, it's one thing to change your life to be nicer to your co-workers. It's quite another to change your life to be incomprehensible to 99.9% of all humanity. So, uh, once you have the psychedelic tool in hand, then real choices have to be made. What is this to you? Is it simply um, uh, something that you do once or twice a year to affirm to yourself that it's possible? Or is it something that you can use in some way for your good and the world's? That's sort of where I have come to rest, and I hope it's not a delusion. But I think that there are ideas out there and that they don't do any good out there, that they only have efficacy if brought into three dimensions. And uh, there are all kinds of ideas. In fact, they are all ideas. So we're talking about a more efficient internal combustion engine, how people can learn to love each other, how to save the planet, the most efficient way of packing uh, crackers in a box for long shelf life and low destruction of their structural integrity. It doesn't matter what the problem is. The answer can be found out there. Well, it puts, it puts people who are into this psychedelic thing in an entirely different stance from all other spiritual seekers because all other spiritual seekers are furiously seeking. Psychedelic people are holding it back with all their power because they are, they are in the presence of the mystery. And then the, the trick is to get a spigot on it so that it can be turned on and off rather than just coming at you like a tidal wave a mile high and 20 miles wide. So uh, it's a different problem, an embarrassment of riches an embarrassment of access to past, present, future, alien dimensions, mantra-hoarding elves, and uh, promise-bearing demons. Uh, and, and so, I, it, strangely enough, it, it creates a certain kind of conservatism. Now, I don't think that everybody realizes this. Many people take psychedelics in order to prove to themselves that they can, and then gain acceptance from their social group. It's a way of fitting in. But those people, you can always evade the mystery. Not always. But if you're, a, if you're trying to from the get-go, you can evade fully confronting the mystery. And, uh, but if it's what you want, you will quickly discover that you, know, you have hit the main vein and that changes the rules of the, of the game pretty entirely. They'll do it up to a point, and then it's particularly sophisticated uh, psychologists and, and, and uh, uh, people like that that, that, that uh, uh, say, well, it'll, 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 it'll take you so far, but then there's something else, and you have to quit doing this and give it up and, and do something else. And my, you know, in my experience is with that is it's not true. That if you want to keep doing it, it'll take you as far as you want to go. That's what I think. I think people who, who quit doing it see something, detect because what it is, is if you think of the self as a diamond 
and you begin to and and then what the psychedelic is is pressure on the diamond well you can raise the pressure to a thousand pounds per square inch and there are no structural flaws but if you raise the pressure to 10,000 pounds per square inch, micro flaws begin to show and shear lines appear. And because everything will fly apart at a certain level, you, one cannot encompass this mystery. I mean, I think finally you have to avert your eyes and just, you know, adore is a strange word and worship is also a strange word. But certainly um, give credit to. It is not a program that you finish. And yes, people who say, I learned all I could from it, probably learned mostly that they shouldn't do more of it. It threatens to put them out of a job, especially if they're psychotherapists. Yeah. Well, it threatens to put anybody out of a job because eventually the contradictions of living in this low-level slice of reality will just become unbearable. And you'll, I mean, this actually happened in the 60s. I mean, many people quit and dropped out for many reasons, but the seed of all that talk about is you just say, you know, this is absurd. I am going to sit. That's not absurd. But, you know, what about your stock brokerage? What about your portfolio? What about your divorce in progress? So all of this, you know, you can't... Uh, uh, no, I think that the depth of this cannot be taken. And eventually, the male ego in every single one of us, regardless of our gender, will uh, feel threatened. Because it's hardly different from death, you know, because uh, you're not going to recognize yourself. That's the point that I wanted to make in talking about the guy up on Cold Mountain. You know, once he ran a gas station, once he followed the Dodgers, but then it all began to slide in this certain direction, and he is no longer recognizable to himself. Uh, Carlos Castaneda has Don Juan say, you must lose your personal history. Well, I don't know whether Don Juan is a real person or whether he ever said that, but it's interesting, that notion. How many of us would be willing to become unrecognizable to ourselves? And yet, obviously, that's the path that one is on. And so then you just decide, well, is there an obligation to go to the end? Do I have to become a genie? Do I have to become a Taoist sage, an immortal? Do, and I think the answer is no. You know, one doesn't have to do that. Uh, Buddhism creates the notion of the bodhisattva. That is, in a way, this same thing. It's where you're just about to go over the hill into incomprehensibility, and then you say, wait a minute. What about the people in the prisons? the naked, the hungry, the oppressed, and you pull back and say, no, I forswear enlightenment until the last being attains enlightenment. Well, it's a noble gesture, but I'll bet these bodhisattvas make this vow with a tremendous sigh of relief. <laughs> now they know what they're going to do with their lives. Oh, good, I'm going to work in prisons and counsel the dying and get into political action. Jeez, for a minute I thought I was going to go straight into the light and, that's, and become unrecognizable to myself and lose my definitions and so forth and so on. Uh, the, I will. <laughs> the um, comment, the two words that struck me interesting was adore and worship. Um, I, I don't know if I got it right. Matthew Fox Friday night uh, quoted um, the Elogian, I think it was Chardin. Mm -hmm. And it struck me interesting because he said that we have come to a point in history now where we must either find some form of meaningful worship or commit suicide. And somehow I, in my, that quote came back when you mentioned uh, when one may reach that point of the penultimate truth of the unspeakable or the formless form or the light or whatever, 
you want to call it, uh, and the mushrooms are pointing the way or whatever, breath therapy, that all these things are only um, something that points you to the ultimate. And when you get there, it, be, it moves into the adoration and the worship level, which, interestingly enough, as I say, becoming coming from a, a mode of being a recovering Catholic, uh, I could never find in any kind of religious community and didn't want to join a monastery for that purpose. Um, and what I see is partially this neurosis or unhappiness that exists in so many people in the, in the country. They have no contextual format for worship because it's it doesn't, it doesn't have that power for them to, to do it. Yeah, so you have to have the personal experience of something to worship. And this is what has been lacking. I mean, it, what the churches are peddling is high abstraction, and you really have to work yourself up into a lather to uh, you know, be able to accept that as, as worthy of that kind of attention. The, the psychedelic... Uh, subset of society is into an experience and you know it's accessible in a way we're like Calvinists not in our ethics or our restraint on behavior but in our insistence on a direct personal relationship with the mystery and uh, this is something very new we have really uh, accepted the idea that Truth descends through hierarchies, basically from Newsweek and Time and the Washington Post down to us as consumers of uh, these various images of what is going on. The notion that you might know more about reality than the combined editorial uh, board of Scientific American and the Journal of Foreign Affairs <laughs> is uh, startling stuff. We always give ourselves away. We don't realize it only it depends on you, you know, to believe that at Cornell or down at SRI people understand the universe is not helpful. You must understand the universe. And if you don't under, if you don't know uh, partial differential calculus, then your model of how the universe works must do it without partial differential calculus. In other words, it's not read anywhere that only one model will work. And in fact, I think all abstract models should be highly suspect. It's going to be it. It's a it's an opportunity. I mean, we have to view life as an opportunity. What are you doing with it? Are you afraid of it? I mean, some people live their lives. Apparently, what they are doing is arranging their deathbed scene. They want it to take place in a large baronial house with clipped green lawns, acres in surround. They want uh, the room in which they die to be filled with fine art. They want their loving heirs to be dutifully assembled while they pass out the final wisdom, and they spend their entire life creating the dramatic scenario of their passage. And of course, you have to work hard because you've got to make the money to buy that house. You have to uh, sire all these children, educate them into your values so they won't be stabbing you in the back and misbehaving in this situation. Uh, you have to create loyalty, possession, power, all of these things. And then you won't die in a ditch, unknown and abandoned, you know. But on the other hand, what was the quality of that life, you know? Uh, life is an opportunity, should we, how much pressure should you put on it? How many places should you go? How many drugs should you take? How many sexual configurations should you experiment with? How many professions should you, uh, uh, and it depends, I think, the question is how seriously do you take it? Do you just think life is a lark and it's fine with you that you're going to go into a pine box and be forgotten for all eternity? <laughs> or do you have some inner consolation that that won't happen and you're going to go off and be with uh, Lao Tzu and Mao and everybody else who ever died? Or, you know, just what is it? And my, I think of it as uh, 
a telephone booth being filled with water, and you can see that when the water reaches the top of the telephone booth, you're going to be dead as a doornail. And so you have 30 years to figure it out. We are alive. There's no contest about that. It's extremely improbable that we should be alive, that we should be here thinking, feeling, sharing. The fact that we're alive throws open the whole game, means anything is probably possible. But I doubt that it's easy. I'll bet you have to be very, very smart to figure out what's going on and get it right. And so I guess I have a sort of private religion of intelligence. It isn't how good you are. It's how wily you are, which was the Greek virtue of Odysseus. You know, that was always his epitaph or his epithet, was uh, he was wily Ulysses. Reality is some kind of maze. It isn't to the swift that the race goes. A maze, a puzzle garden that you walk through to try and find your way out. Uh, the race isn't to the swift, it's to the thoughtful, the careful, the one who can tease it all apart. Well, for puzzle solving, the psychedelic is this tremendously powerful tool because it extends the domain of mind, and that's what's necessary to make it go. Okay, moving through these things and, and discussing dosage, uh, probably in, in order of the likelihood of your encountering them, uh, mushrooms, I feel that uh, people who weigh around 140 pounds should take five dried grams. This is a stiff hit. This is a committed hit. <laughs> it, it, there will be difficult moments in a five gram trip, but on the other hand, um, you'll, certain questions will be solved forever for you uh, because you will validate the existence of this dimension. You will see what your relationship to it is. Uh, I don't believe in uh, diddling with these things. The, uh, people tend to take tiny amounts thinking that one-tenth of a dose is one-tenth of an experience. Well, that doesn't work like that. I mean, half a dose can be no experience at all. And a full dose can feel like ten of these experiences. So trivializing it is really, uh, and I use this word advisedly, but sinful because you're trivializing the only mystery or one of the... It's like trivializing sex. I mean, the ordinary objections to pornography are not my objections. But uh, to my mind, a very strong objection to pornography is that it trivializes. And anything which trivializes anything central to our self-definition is uh, uh, bad mental hygiene is about the only way I could put it. And taking small doses of psychedelics tends to trivialize them. And there are people uh, who probably take LSD every weekend and go dancing and have done this for years and have no idea what LSD is capable of. The main shift in the use pattern with LSD is from empathy I mean, it may have been childish, but the style of the 60s was, how many mics can you bolt down, you know? Have you had the 500? Have you had the 1,000? Have you had the 2,000? Well, eventually it becomes moot because you just dissolve into shimmering atoms for longer and longer periods of time on these trips. But the modern approach, which is how little can you get away with taking and still be one of the gang, is e even more insidious, you know, because then people feel capable of talking about these things. And, uh, uh, you know, there are people who feel that their opinions on the psychedelic experience should be weighed very carefully who have only taken MDMA. <laughs> well, listen, I've got news for you. I mean, that is to the domain we're talking about, like a, a broken tricycle to a Tessa Rosa Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is a general comment that you should take a committed dose of whatever it is you're, you're, 
you're taking so that there is no ambiguity because there's nothing worse than a sub-threshold psychedelic experience because what it is is it's all show and no go. You know, you feel the CNS activation, you feel the keyboards light up, everything comes on, you start down the runway, you pick up speed, you pick up speed, you pick up speed, <laughs> and then you come to the end of the runway and taxi back to the hangar. And, you know, well, that was not a flight to Boston. That was just clogging the traffic pattern. <clears throat> So committed doses, and, and then because you're going to take a committed dose, inform yourself of the medical and pharmacological chit-chat on the matter so that you can feel reassured, you know, and talk to a heart specialist. Questions like, if, if my heart is pounding, does that mean I'm having a heart attack? Uh, what is a fibrillation and how will I recognize it? Because you can have very odd feelings and not be in any danger whatsoever, you know? And your heart can pound. It's made to pound. <laughs> Look at all these aerobic exercise freaks. <laughs> well, the fact that you're sitting still and this begins to happen doesn't mean that you've been shoved to death's door. It just means, you know, that everything is equalizing and coming to some kind of equilibrium. And you're passing through a... A transition. These drugs do have a kind of mock barrier. In other words, a, there is a barrier somewhat like the speed of sound. Uh, it's a pharmacological and physiological barrier. So you take the compound, the plant, whatever it is. Nothing happens for 40 minutes or so except false starts and little things and you have to go pee and then you come back and you sit down. And then it begins to come on, and it's like it can have many manifestations, but it can be chills, tremoring, knotted stomach, nausea, uh, just restlessness, so forth and so on. This is what I call, taking a page from the engineering book, Q. Q in engineering circles is vibration in a physical system. And you may even, when they, when they launch the space shuttle, if you listen to the radio chit-chat, they will say, uh, approaching Max Q, and then they'll say, Max Q, Mark, and then they're through that. What that means is that as the system approaches a transition, it begins to shake. It begins to shake as though it's going to shake to pieces. And the Q forces are building on all the air, air uh, surfaces, the airframe. Then you break through that, Q falls to zero, and you're in the cool, you know, main engine cutoff. You are now in orbit. All vibration has ceased. Noise has ceased. You are in orbit. You are weightless. You are there. It's different. Now you shut down all these switches related to the launch procedure and begin to set a course through a different kind of medium, a medium characterized by smoothness, stillness, and, uh, and that sort of thing. LSD, I, I don't see anything wrong with the 300, 400 micrograms as an initial dose. I don't see any point in running up into the 1,500 to 2,000 gamma range because in my experience, what happens is at higher doses, there's simply a, a, an area where you can't remember what happened. And the higher the dose, the longer that period of time. But since you can't remember anything about it, why, you know, it should be shortened. DMT, 70 milligrams, uh, vaporized in a glass pipe and, uh, and 70 milligrams. Yeah. In LSD, uh, I have been in large doses of LSD at times, and it's always seemed to me that it's very difficult to process all the stimuli coming in. The biocomputer just, at one point, for me at least, uh, one time I did uh, like 4,000 months ago, and uh, the biocomputer just shut down for a while. I just, I just, I, like you said, I forgot exactly. Yeah, I, it's I, I overload, the overload mm -hmm. and it, overload. it just shunts it past you. Um, what do we need to cover here? Uh, 
DMT, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, which, uh, you know, uh, I think probably you all know, 125, 150 milligrams. Uh, and because I tell you these doses doesn't necessarily mean I approve of all these things. I'm just saying if you take them, these are the doses. Ketamine, people take small amounts, again, uh, usually after attaining some amount of proficiency with it, I haven't, I've only done it four or five times and always fairly large doses, 130, 150. Interesting compound, but uh, contraindicated because of physiological problems. Uh, depresses the immune system, possibility of epileptic kindling. Certainly, uh, if you were to vomit in that state, you might well strangle because you wouldn't be able to clear your throat. Uh, I don't like the, what I have against ketamine also is uh, you have to shoot it, you know. As I was driving home last night, I was listening to some program, and, and they were talking about intravenous drugs. And I thought, how interesting. That's a distinction you don't hear made very often. They were saying, we should legalize all drugs except intravenous drugs. Well, so that's, of course, morphine uh, cocaine, heroin, ketamine, steroids, I suppose, uh, like that. That's an interesting distinction, operationally. Uh, yeah. You can, but I would, um, I've heard that it's dangerous because, yeah, it's IM. It's IM. When they give it as an anesthetic, they give it 600 milligrams IV push which must be just like being struck from behind by a freight train. I'm, I'm sure you never know what hit you. I mean, imagine a, a, an exploratory dose is uh, 100, let's say, IM. They're talking about IV directly into the vein, 600, push. That means pressure on the, on the feeder, so it's just like a high pressure uh, filling of your gas tank. You would never know what hit you.